Hello, everybody. It's Keith. Help support the Northeast scene and declare yourself a member today. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast medium of choice. Rate us and leave a review. Every little bit helps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has every podcast episode plus other exclusive content. Like and leave a comment. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the NE Scene. Also, continue to write us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We want to share your experiences as well. And now, here's the show. You know what they want? Obedient workers. Because they own this fucking place. It's a big club. And you ain't in it. All day long, beating you over the head in their media, telling you what to believe, what to think, and what to buy. The game is rigged, and nobody seems to notice. Nobody seems to care. It's called the American Dream, because you have to be asleep to believe it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. This is Keith. And Tommy. What's up? We're back. We're doing it. We're ready. So how's it going, Tommy? What's up with you? Not much. Uh, I got my flu shot today. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Do, yeah. Do you, have you gotten the flu before, and that's why you get the flu shot, or do you just get it? No, I just get it as a preventative thing um, because my immune system stinks because not having my spoon. Oh, right. Yeah, they they make sure I get it because uh, I've gotten the flu, um, I think, I've only gotten it twice in my entire life. and But each time I've gotten it, I've gotten really, really sick for an extended period of time. So, like, when I got the flu last time, it was like... I want to say eight. It was over a week. It was like eight or nine days. And uh, I got really, really, really sick. Um, It was in college. And I actually had to go to the hospital because I got so dehydrated from, uh, you know, because, you know, the things that go with flu, like vomiting and diarrhea and you can't keep food down and stuff like that. So I ended up having to go to the hospital and get an IV. Wow. Yeah. See, I don't I don't get the flu ever. Any time I got sick was just as a result of something I was putting into my body. But I don't get I don't get the flu at all, and I hear when you get the flu shot, you don't feel good for a day or something like that. So I just don't get it. Yeah, I I actually am kind of waiting on. I got it at uh two thirty this afternoon, so probably like right around when I go to bed tonight, I'm gonna start to feel not. I my reaction is usually fairly can like it's normal and it's like something i can respond to pretty quickly but it's mm-hmm. like you know just tylenol i did i did, you know i usually spike a little bit of a fever and i feel like achy and tired but it you know nothing that it, that's why i get it usually i try to get it in the afternoon so that um i can just kind of sleep it off overnight that's good that's yeah. good yeah i you know what i gotta go to saint cloud minnesota next week oh shit this is going to be my first flight of the year, and I really don't want to do it. Yeah, I don't. I don't blame you. <laughs> I had yeah. a hard enough time going to get my flu shot today. When I was like in there, I was like, I I made sure they did it at my school. So like CVS does the clinic thing at my school, so like you don't have to like go anywhere to do it. So I just went to That's my good. school. I had a meeting real quick at school. And then I went downstairs and I got there 15 minutes early and she was setting up and I was like, Hey, I'm here for the flu shot. So she literally, I I filled out my paperwork and I got my flu shot before the clinic even was supposed to start. It was like one 55. It was supposed to start at two. I was walking out the door. I was like, all right. I saw people walking up. They're like, Hey, is it ready? I'm like, yeah, I'm done. Bye. I like the idea of going somewhere and just getting casually injected with a needle. Yeah. Well, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you see what i did there yeah I, I got that i that took me a split second well i have to go to st cloud minnesota i don't want to go it's for an on-site assignment for work is it a law firm uh no it, this is a financial institution so this is going to be a go in and fix type of deal gotcha. i'm like mr wolf from pulp fiction but for offices sometimes you go in and make the logistics work 
Oh, yes. Yes. And uh, so I'll be doing that. And, you know, I, I got to do it. I, I don't want to be a, I don't want to say like, no, I'm not doing that. Because they've laid a lot of people off and I don't want to be one of them. Yeah. That's a horrible prospect. If it, Yeah. And if it comes down to me and one other guy who's willing to go and I'm not, yeah. who are they going to pick? I want to be the go-to guy. There you go. So folks, we're going to be talking to Kenny Vasoli of Vacationer and the starting line tonight. That's yeah. exciting, right? Yeah, and it's so funny. We actually, like I, it's one of the things that like <laughs> the starting line is literally from our area. I don't I don't think I really ever I knew who Kenny was, but I've mm-hmm. never had any interaction with him. I've literally never spoken to him. Yeah, and it, it just shows how expansive our scene is and how many people there were. And I wasn't really aware of that band at all until they had the single. So I was aware of them as Sunday drive. I remember Mm -hmm. seeing them Sunday drive on shows. Um, But honestly, this is goes back to that, that hardcore elitism and not like, (laughs) but it's like the, uh, that's like a pop punk show. I'm not going to that shit. Like, and it, it really, I think a lot of it came down to me being a sn- like, you know, a snobby little brat kid and not wanting to go because there was no heavy bands. Yeah, that's, that was my deal. And then later I got into Saves the Day and New Found Glory. That was about as far as I ventured into the pop punk arena. There is some pop punk I'd like. Oh, Blink, of course. They're the kings of it. Blink-182. Did you oh, ever yeah. get into them? No. Uh, I, I, you know what? I, I liked the songs that were on the radio. I thought those were, and I always thought their videos were funny. Like the, yeah, I, they always had good, funny videos, but like, I never, the three album run of Enema of the State, Take Off Your Pants and Jacket and Self Titled are the tops that that's like, you know, that's the Led Zeppelin one, two, and three of, of pop punk right they, there. They did, uh, there's a really great song of theirs that I didn't. I, I don't know if it was ever on the radio, but I remember somebody playing it. Um, at I was at somebody's house and they played it. I think it's called "Going Off to College." It is, yeah. It's a really, really good song. It's a really great song, and I, I just remember hearing it being like, "Oh, is this Blink One Eighty Two? Because you know they have that. They could, you know, they sound like them. Like they're, you know, regardless of whatever album it is, it sounds like Blink One Eighty Two. But I was like, oh, this is a really good song. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I, I stopped keeping track of them after the self-titled. That's when they broke up and got back together. And I don't know. I think the two guys were like recording their parts separately. And I don't know, it's a whole bunch of stuff. But that three album run, perfect. Oh, yeah. And the one dude's like a total crazy person now, right? The the one guy's well, like in, in aliens or something. Now, that is that is up for debate because... <laughs> He's doing a lot of work to expose UFOs and the Navy or NASA or NSA or one of those released those UFO videos. Oh, get out, really? So yeah. And he there's... said, I think he said, we knew about this and I don't know. I don't know what's true and what's not. I don't know if aliens exist. There is actually a Blink-182 song called Aliens Exist. Oh. Uh, it's a good one. But I don't know. Where are they? I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I'm one of those people of like, I, I need something tangible. I need some proof. A yes. lot of it seems very circumstantial. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, well, take a look at this. How could this have done? It's all like the same thing. I don't want to get in, but it, like, it's always like the same thing. I, when somebody brings up like nine eleven, I'm like, I, how much do you know about how jet fuel burns? What the fuck are you talking about? And it's always like somebody that's like a fucking complete like idiot that like starts to talk to me about it, and I'm like really you're a physicist you're an engineer like you're a structural engineer you know how this shit works get the fuck out of here like you're some fucking person that read something on the internet or watched a youtube video stop yeah i i'll i'll admit i was a 9-11 conspiracy guy for like a weekend because i (laughs) i stayed up all weekend getting high and drunk and i went down a youtube wormhole and i thought it would i thought it would be provocative to talk about at a party so i i just got into it but thank god it, it didn't become a lasting thing. Yeah. How, how can, how do you know how a building is going to react to a plane flying into it? I, I, that's I mean, a, and not just a plane, a, a jumbo jet. Yeah. It's, it's just a weird one. I didn't get it. And I, I think that's one of those things that's like, it's because it's so 
in contrast or reality, people want to explain it some way mm-hmm. and, and they look for explanations. They're like, this couldn't have happened. Well, it kind of did. <laughs> like, I, there's fucking thirty angles of it. Like, like, you know. And don't give don't give this country that much credit. You really think we could pull off something to that level? I mean, come on. I've seen we we've installed dictators in places and stuff like that. We've we've you know fomented uh, military coups in places. However, yeah, but we just send weapons. We don't like we don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. I actually always think of. Uh, you know, like, you know, people talk about like Area 51. I don't remember who it was. It was, it was, a, it was a comedian. So it was like Bill Burr or somebody like that. Right. And they do a whole thing where they were like, do you really think that like, you know, 2000 people work at that facility and no one's ever at a bar and had too much to drink and be like, you know what? I'm just going to fucking tell you the story, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's never gotten out. Like everybody's like, you know, like, what did they, how would you keep that? under wraps with so many people being involved like there's too many there's too many variables and too many people that are involved that are you know liable to do something you know and i I just think it's it's so it's such a weird thing when people bring that up because i'm always like you know I, i worked with a lady and i remember she was really smart and uh she had like this phenomenal education she went to like what you know ivy league schools and had like advanced degrees and then the one day she started talking to me about the illuminati and i was like all right i got it like i, I, I don't <laughs> i don't want it and she's like you know they're in the satanic worship i'm like fuck man like i don't know satan's pretty rad like <laughs> like slayer <laughs> slayers into satan i don't i don't know dude like like really i just you you immediately just go i go into retreat mode when someone starts talking to me about something like that because i know what they really want me to say is you're right you're right yeah, or tell me more and i'll be i'll just be like oh that's nice and yeah, just shut it down yeah I what's do. that uh what's that one experiment that military experiment that crazy people bring up the oh, one from back in the day mk ultra yeah yeah whenever yeah. someone mentions that i'm out because it's, it's like always going to be followed by something crazy <laughs> yeah man they were dosing people with lsd uh-huh and yeah, like <laughs> I always think about that stuff. The conspiracies, they, I I get. I think the the thing that like is appealing about them is they're almost like they're they're movie like. They really have these twists and turns and uh, these plot reveals that you're like, holy shit, I can't believe that's true, or wow, how it could have happened. And then you're like, wait a minute, this is reality. <laughs> like, it's like that scene in The Godfather, and he's like, you know. He's like, you think too much of me. I am the hunted one. You know, like, <laughs> <you're> like <laughs> well, folks, we're going to talk to Kenny now. So here he is. Enjoy. All right, folks, we're here now with Kenny Vasoli. Woo! What up? <laughs> Kenny, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Yes, this is awesome. Thanks for coming on. You know, several people have told me you got to get Kenny on the show I was like, yes, please. And one of one of my friends was even like, hey, you should get Kenny on the show. And this was way back when I was afraid to ask people to come on that I didn't know. Like, I was still just asking my friends. Yeah. And I was like, do you think he'd come on the show? We want to have him on the show. And he's like, yeah, ask him. I'm honored and thank you. And I, that's all. That's kind of the extent of my knowledge about your show is I've just sort of was browsing the guests that you had on. And it seems like I've had um, a lot of old pals that have, you know, <laughs> frequent into your show so it seems like i'll fit right in here oh absolutely and kenny this is why we started this show because as you know we come from such a rich music scene the amount of bands the amount of people the amount of great music that has come out of that area is just insane yeah i I totally agree with you about the level of talent that um coincidentally or maybe just um environmentally happened around this area it's it's cool and it's um pretty amazing to see the accomplishments of like the you know same people that i you know like played shows with at the skate park (laughs) (laughs) so let's take it back a little bit where did you grow up so i grew up in uh haber horsham pennsylvania and you know what's funny is i'm from Bucks County, I have no idea where that is. I've only heard of it like once. So it's uh, it's just right across County Line Road into Montgomery County. So it's like not far uh, from Lansdale, not far from Doylestown, not far from uh, Willow Grove. Um, 
you know, so it's pretty much like a central like turnpike stop. Um, it's just kind of one of these smaller towns that just mixes mixes in with like Upper Moreland and yeah, you know, um, like Southampton is and Warminster are also very close, which are in Bucks County. So it's like uh, I've hung out with all the Bucks County kids. So tell us about growing up. What was your what was your intro to music? Did you come from a musical family? Have you always been interested in music? I uh, came from a family that always appreciated music, and my dad was kind of you know an appreciator and like concert goer and would, you know, kept up with Dylan and the stones and all that stuff, uh, you know, loved like Clapton and, and Credence and uh, Van Morrison and all that stuff. So I was like dished a heavy diet of that stuff on like car trips and stuff like that. So I was like, you know, like uh, I could appreciate a good song from an early age. Cause I think he's, he had really good and still does have really good taste in music and then my mom also, you know, like had her uh, collection that, you know, she was listening to like Fine Young Cannibals and um, was that the band or 10,000 Maniacs? Uh, yeah. And like stuff like that. And even like Emmylou Harris, uh, like they but they both had like really good taste and was stuff that like even now I can kind of root through their old CD collection and really appreciate a lot of it. But neither of them were really musicians. Um, m- my brother started playing piano around five. And then so I was like three. And then by the time I was five, I was like just sick of like waiting in the car, just like hanging out up front while my brother was taking lessons. And I just Mm -hmm. would just sit in there and then take lessons after him eventually. And then he started playing guitar. And I think that that kind of sparked a little competition to me want to do something like that. And then I picked bass because I figured that would be the most difficult to position to fill in a band. You know, I was nine years old when, you know, like I first started learning bass. So that was like, I didn't think I would find another nine year old that would, you know, play bass in a band with me. So I just like kind of volunteered that instrument and like figured I could wrap my nine year old head around it and like would watch like Chris Novoselic and like um, Mike Dirt and stuff and be like, oh, that doesn't seem like it seems less complicated and less cumbersome (laughs) than a guitar because everything is spread out and I see all four strings. It's just easier to see what they're doing. Yes. Um, so, it, and I also just thought it looked cooler. I thought that like, I was like, why does it, look, is it like bigger and like kind of stranger? Um, so bass always like fascinated me. And then once I started taking lessons and had this guy, you know, when I would bring in like real big fish songs for him to like show me how to play it, he, and then I would like quickly realize that like, oh yeah, the guitar line has fucking nothing to do with what I'm going to learn. It's like this other thing that I would never even noticed before. Right. And this other thing that walks all over the goddamn place and in like crazy rhythms and stuff. So I was like, oh man, this is like, okay. Like, you know, I just had to recalibrate my, my brain, but um, I had enough, I had a cool enough guy teaching me that I was really like fascinated with it and took to it right away. And, um, you know, by the time I was like 11 or 12, I was just like in like a bunch of bands. Did you take lessons uh, at a, like a music shop or did you go to private lessons? Like, what'd you do? Yeah, I took lessons at a music shop that's still around. It's actually in Hapero now, um, but it was in Willow Grove when I first started taking lessons. It was, uh, it's called DeLuca Music. Dude, that's where I went. Yeah, no, but yeah, <laughs> wow. I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> have probably taken lessons in like, you know, pretty notable bands. Um, and I even took vocal lessons there uh, eventually. Um, and I still like, I go there all the time to get strings and picks and stuff. So this is a little plug for DeLuca music. Keep them in business. That's nice. crazy. Yeah. It used to be right next to, uh, what was the name of the Chinese food place that was right there? Right on the corner. Yeah. Uh, I don't Man- know. They, Man- Mandarin garden. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. They tore all that down. Those are all like high rises now. Oh yeah. I saw that. I actually yeah. had to go down there. Like my, uh, my cousins used to go to, they went to St. David's in Willow Grove. So like we went past their old house, like not that long ago. And I was like, wow, this looks wildly different. I actually got lost. Like, yeah, I was like it's, gonna... it's really crazy to see. And like the, the across the street is, is exactly as it's always been. <laughs> so it's like, you can, you can really like, at least you can see a little bit of the history. It's not totally wiped out. The only thing that I got my bearings from was like, okay, so there's the train tracks. I got yep. that. Like, yeah, Burger <laughs> King's still there. Yes. <laughs> the Bakery tra- is still there. Tommy, did you take bass lessons? Or did no. you just learn? No? I took guitar lessons at DeLuca for, 
Uh, I think I went for three lessons. The guy's name was Lou. Um, yeah, my brother took lessons from Lou. Yeah, <laughs> so I, his he was really nice. He was a shorter guy, uh, super long hair. Yep. And I remember when I went in for guitar lessons, I wanted to learn um, Metallica songs. And I remember after like the second lesson, I was like, I want to learn this song. And he was like, okay. And he literally walked up to the front of the store and got the book and brought it back. And I was like, Wait, what oh, is right. It? And that that's when you just took the book and you were done. <laughs> it's right? like, I'm like, I think yeah. I just went out to the car and I was like, I told my mom, I was like, I need $25. She's like, why? I'm like, I don't think I need to take these lessons anymore. He taught me out of this book and I, I learned how to read the, the notes. And she's like, you learned how to read music? I'm like, no, I, I, but I'll show it to you when I get in a car. And she, like, as soon as she saw it, she was like, wait, is this everything you want to learn? I'm like, yes, this is it. Like, so I stopped going. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but he was a super nice guy. And I thought it was yeah. one of the weirdest things is I do remember this is that um, when you went in, it was like, I mean, it was like a closet, literally like yeah. you took lessons in a closet and um, it was really overpoweringly smelled like smoke when you got in there. Like, oh, yeah. It, like it's it, they were allowed to smoke in the bu- like in the building and while they were like doing lessons. So like literally yeah. there was an ashtray with like 100 cigarettes in it, like three feet from my face. When I was yeah. Taking lessons. <laughs> yeah, I think like I'm pretty sure like the guy that taught me must have smoked. But like, I think he was ni- I don't ever remember him sparking up. I think he was courteous enough to not <laughs> blaze up around <laughs> a nine year old. But he would always come in with Chinese food. And just be like <laughs> chowing down as he as a, he's like yeah yeah dude, just run through it a couple times yeah so I I chose bass at first too because I figured that would be the easiest you know I always look for the easy way out first yeah and then finally someone taught me how to read basic tablature for nice. guitar and I was like okay I can do this so that's kind of how I m- made the jump to that. The rest of the discussion is just going to be us asking you names of people if you know them or not. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm going to do awful at this. Yeah. No, no, no. This is, we found my true Achilles heel. You know what was funny <laughs> is Kenny. Like when I just doing like some like preliminary stuff, I was looking through like or I was like, all right, let me just look search up starting line stuff, and it was like, hey, the band's from Churchville, and I was like, I grew up in Churchville. How the fuck do I not know any of these dudes? Like I don't know any. Yeah, of these. yeah. it's uh, it's strange. It's strange. Because we all went to a lot of the same shows together. We lived in the same area, but I don't think I ever met you. Like, oh. it's it's just, it's it's wild. Yeah. So I was in, I mean, I was uh, much younger than the, the other guys in the band that would be, you know, become starting line. And uh, Matt was the only one that lived in Churchville. He went to Council Rock and he was 20 by the time I met him and I was 14. So like oh, wow. just entering high school and he was like in his first or second year of college. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so like I kind of became friends with a lot of these Bucks County dudes that were in bands around like his age and like, you know, a few years older or younger. So I was like okay. hanging out with like the guys from like, you know, Chrissy and like Metroplex who were like, oh, you know, okay. kind of like going into their thirties, even at that point. <laughs> yeah. I remember yeah. even I was at, uh, like one of my first parties that I was allowed to go to, like I was, uh, I must've been like 15, something like that. And um, it was a, like a Christmas Eve Eve party. These like Jack from Chrissy would throw these like pretty epic um, Christmas Eve Eve parties. And this time we implemented the rule to like, everyone was wearing suits. And then I remember like, Mike from starting line being like, yo, that's the singer, of the dead milkman over there. And it's just like, <laughs> and he's just like, you know, three sheets to the wind, like on the couch. And I was like, Oh my God, like what the, what did my life like become all of a sudden? It was like so crazy. So you got started playing in bands early. How, how old were you? Um, well, I guess like it was really loose at first. Uh, like I, you know, as soon as I started like taking lessons to play bass, I was like, okay, yeah. Like me and my friend, like that had a drum set. I'm like, okay, we're a band now. And like, <laughs> you know, like maybe Phil can play guitar. I heard Phil has a guitar. And then like, you know, like, but Phil, like, I don't think ever practiced with us, but I would still be like, yeah, we're a band. Um, and then I, that band, um, Smash Adams was like my middle school and like um, beginning high school band. I played with uh, this guy, Chris Gonzalez from like really early age to like, you know, like 10 years old until I was like, 14 Mm -hmm. pretty much until i met the starting line guys and um you know i was in various bands like throughout middle school and high school like playing like everything from 
ska bands to like i was in basically like a like a rap metal band oh really <laughs> yeah like uh i would just do anything you know these these people would just be like yeah will you sing for our band and i'll be like yeah i'll do it like i i think i was in like four bands at one point just because i i wanted to play music oh as wait much as possible i just thought of this this is such an old connection but uh do you remember a band so you're from that happer horsham kind of area they used to play in there all the time do you remember a band called surge yep yeah, that was like I think maybe one of the first local bands I ever saw was Surge. <laughs> we, we had Pat Troxel on, and Pat and I were talking about it, and he was like, "Yeah, dude, those guys from Surge tried to beat me up one time. I remember I started a fight with them. I was like, hilarious. <laughs> I just remember seeing yeah. them at the skate park and being like, "Wow, these dudes are way older than everybody here. Like, it's a very strange kind of scene, and they sounded like." um I don't even I, like new metal, like corn. Yeah, they, they were like corn, yeah. yeah. And I was like super into corn too when I when I found out about Surge. So I was I was not too cool to listen to Surge. <laughs> I thought I thought they were the shit. But I also thought Pat Troxel's bands were the shit too. So I liked everything, you know. Like I liked corn, I liked Limp Bizkit, but I also fucking loved Fugazi and loved, uh, you know, Nirvana and like Face to Face and like No Effects and like screeching weasel and like you know less than jake and uh bruce lee band like i just i've like whatever was like weird looking at the at the record store i was just like into it that's good i think it's good to have eclectic taste that young because when i was younger i had my head up my ass and i i would just list i would just stick with one thing you know what i mean like i only yeah. listen to hardcore that sounds like this, or I only listen to emo bands that sound like this. And it's like one thing to the next. Yeah. I was not a purist at all. Like, <laughs> but the, the, I did love like pop punk the most, but pop punk was like a real like fringe kind of thing where it wasn't like, it, there was not an abundance of bands to pick from. Like I found face to face and I was like, Oh, this is like the closest to like the kind of music that kind of speaks to me. And is also the kind of band that I want to be in. So I just like, any kind of creative endeavor that I would be at like the forefront of. I just wanted it to sound like face to face. Right. And yeah, it wasn't really on my radar, but then Blink released Enema of the State in 98 or 99, I think. And that, that kind of changed things. Yeah. I was like, I was like, this is really cool. And it was a unifying album. Like I remember being in a car with Colin Frangicetto and Mike Shaw, and we were all listening to it. And I was like, oh, this is unexpected, but this is really good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always loved Blink. Like I was, I went to go see Blink at uh, the Electric Factory when they were like still touring off a of dude ranch. Right. And um, I don't think that we like knew because there wasn't like really like much of an internet at that point. So I, no one really like knew that the, that they had gotten a new drummer, but then mm -hmm. like, I saw like Travis setting up his kit at this show and I'm like, Oh, that guy, like, look at that guy. Oh, and yeah. then like and then he like started playing the set and i'm like oh my god this guy fucking rips there's a thing about pop punk bands i remember hearing so many of them being like oh okay i get it I, like i got the appeal of it but it just didn't like kind of hit a nerve with me and uh -huh. then i think i was in i was in college and somebody gave me a record by that band rufio and i was yeah. so floored i was like wow this drummer is fucking fast, dude. I've like, I've never heard anybody do stuff like that before. And I was like, I really, I was just kind of floored by it. And I was like, wow, this is a really great band. And like, they have really, really intricate harmonies. Like they, they, they yeah. layer things really well. I was like, wow, these guys are smart. This is like well-produced. Like this is clever. Like it, it was the first record that I heard that I went really like, okay, I can actually see myself putting this on in my car and like listening to this. Yeah. yeah. Before that, was it a lot of just heavy stuff? Yeah, I was big into like, uh, like, like hardcore for the most part, but I, I did get into. So my thing is, is like I was in uh, a band with Anthony Green before he was in Circa. Oh, Audience so, of One? Yeah. So oh, nice. I, yeah, so I played bass for Audience of One. And so Anthony got me into from away from the, like the heavier stuff and got me into things like Promise Ring and Mineral and uh, Jazz June and yeah. that kind of – that was where he kind of like led me to. And I was like, wow, there's a whole like kind of entire – landscapes of music that i just haven't explored and i think a lot of it came from 
uh, like Keith said, I was this close minded. And I think a lot of it came from just being in hardcore is like, no, you listen to this. Like this yeah. is, this is what's cool. Don't listen to that. Yo, they're on that record label. Everything on that's corny. It's like, really? Like, okay. <laughs> like, and, and it's such a, uh, like it, they, there's a reason they call it the scene. Like there's like, you know, there's such a, like a fad kind of mentality that goes along with things that like, yeah. you would and that kind of locked onto, you know, I, I just bought into that. I was like, no, oh, yeah. this is what I, this is what I listen to. These are the people we hang out with. And anyone who doesn't do that sucks. Like, I remember hearing people say like, they would hype bands up and they'd be like, dude, did you ever hear this band? I'd hear them and be like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so Kenny, the, the first band you were in that I've heard of is Sunday Drive. Now you guys played out around in Bucks and around the area, right? Yeah. So that was starting line. We were just kind of forced to change our name uh, by the time we signed to Drive Through. But it's all the same guys from Starting Line. There was a Christian band that had your name, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So Audience of One had the same problem. <laughs> oh no way! Christian band too. <laughs> There's a Christian band called Audience of One, and then yeah. I found uh, I was down the shore what was it two years ago and i saw somebody wearing an audience of one t-shirt and i was like oh shit like that's crazy and i was like oh i i actually kind of sparked a conversation with them i'm like oh that's that band uh the the christian band and they're like no i'm like i'm sorry what is this then and it's uh oh my god the name escapes me right now the guy who used to play uh he was the quarterback for the eagles it's his uh christian based charity group Oh, it's okay. called for for an audience of one. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. All right. Well, that's a weird name for a charity. Yeah. Well, I think the whole thing is, is like the audience of one is God. Like you, you are performing for that's your sole focus should be God. Oh, see, like you see the like the idea yeah. is that you're you're yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I I definitely <laughs> I definitely had a moment of like, no, is somebody bootlegging audience of one T-shirts? Like, I can I get one? Like. <laughs> So, Kenny, did you go to a lot of shows in Lower Bucks? Were you ever an, at any of the Palanca gigs or downtown oh, yeah. at the Stalag and Kill Time and all that? Yep. Yeah, pretty much anything that I could like be let out of the house for, I was there. Um, I mean, I I lived in like Horsham, so I was ending up like at an early age. I was going to a lot of stuff at like New Life Church, yeah. which is in like uh, kind of near Glenside. And yeah, I was definitely going to, once I hooked up with the the Sunday drive starting line guys, then, you know, they would give me rides to Polanka park and, you know, um, Pontiac grill and shit like that. And like, we would go see, uh, like all the local shows and, and also got to like play on, you know, at a lot of those places. How did Sunday drive come together? And I'm asking cause. I was taking guitar lessons when I was young, right? And then I put it down. But when I got into hardcore, I saw all my friends playing music. And I'm like, holy shit, this is possible. Like, this is incredible. I need to be doing this. And I tried and tried to get into bands, but it just never seemed to happen. And, you know, it took me a while to get into my first band. So you got started young. You're in a lot of bands. How was it? Were you nervous? I mean, was it a lot of pressure? How did you cope with all of it? Uh, I... I I didn't have a lot of stage fright at that point. I mean, I was playing enough um, and like just like wetting, you know, wetting my feet like enough to like really kind of get a feel for like playing local shows and um, and just like how to like, you know, write a song or write a bass line. I mean, I was also like when I met those guys, I was 14 years old. So I was like really just kind of figuring it out. And um, but, I, you know. I was far enough along that like it was um, it was easy for me to get a gig because like, I mean, being a bass player is like, I mean, I can't recommend it enough to someone like hopeful of being put in a band, you know, like everyone plays guitar, but like mm-hmm. no one, you know, I, even me, like I, I, I'm like hard, uh, hard up to like think of people that actually like, like learned bass as their first instrument. Right. So I think I was kind of known for that, that I wasn't like a guitar player. I was actually a bass player and, you know, was, you know, I mean, for whatever, for a 14 year old was like learning the craft and I was like in jazz band and shit like that. So I like, you know, people knew that I liked a lot of music and so they wouldn't be afraid to ask me to jam with them. And they knew that I was like, 
a kind of an agreeable guy too. So I would oftentimes say, yes, I would just want to play with whoever. Uh, but by the time I met those guys, I was playing with my band smash Adams and it was like, you know, like I was trying to make it like my face to face kind of band. And we were playing at the Ivy land skate park where like, you know, uh, I even think I saw audience of one there. And, uh, I was at, before that show. Um, I got an email from Matt Watts from Starting Line, and he was looking for someone to sing for his band, and was like, you know, saw on my AOL profile that I had just like used all the space to just list bands that I liked, you know, like Lagwagon, and yeah, you know, and, I did that too. Yeah, like I, that was kind of the move back then. But you yeah. know, like I would try to go deep and like impress people with it, you know, and put like face to face and Fugazi and Lifetime and you know, shit that was like deeper. Um, so I guess that got his attention and he, you know, like was corresponding with me and I, I told him that my band was playing at Ivy land that weekend. And he was like, Oh, that's like right by me. So I'll go, you know, we'll just meet up there and I'll come check out your band. Mm -hmm. And that was that, like we met up and, you know, like exchanged numbers. And then like a week or two later, he like picked me up and drove me to his parents house like and then we jammed at like uh, what was like the first kind of uh incarnation of starting line it like you know went through like one little member uh like switch out after that first practice and then it was pretty much locked in how was it in the beginning did you notice you were getting like a good reaction from people it was like any other band you know like for the first you know for the first string of shows, um, and even like the first few tours, like it's just like we're a new band. Um, at least with the sound, I felt like, you know, this is finally kind of like I'm 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 like batting um I don't know, you know, like where where I should be as far as like um I don't know, people that were like taking the music seriously and also just had like similar influences. It was just like, it was hard to find these kind of people that would be into this music. Like, I don't know. I think I was the only one in my school who even knew face to face was. So like yeah. meeting people that were like old enough to like understand and appreciate, and then also expose me to bands like Jimmy Eat world and get up kids and shit like that. It uh, was just like a great fit. And it was like, they, you know, were recording like little demos for me before, like I even joined the band and like would pass them to me. And I just remember like listening to those demos all the time and like trying to like sing along like little ideas just to like get a feel for the style. And I was just like, I, I really took to just the style of the band because it felt like really cool. Like, you know, very, very like, I don't know, like um, not like not like street punk, but still like had some aggression, but still had melody to it. But then like still like had like weirdness and like, you know, cause we didn't uh, totally know how to write a song yet. So it still had like some weird angular elements that like were probably there kind of by accident just mm -hmm. from like listening to bands like Jimmy eat world and mineral. Um, so it was, it was really exciting because like it was, it felt like um, kind of a moment of like discovery for me to like be able to have that kind of growth, like, being able to play with these people. I remember just being really excited and just trying to like not be too excited to like fuck it up. And, you know, like I was still very young. So like that first summer that we were a band, like I was still like, I was like signed up to go to summer camp. Like that was like, a, <laughs> I was at a normal age where that was like a thing for me to do. Like I was a counselor in training. So it was like, you know, a, like, um, you know, I was like kind of old, but like, I was like, you know, so into the camp that I was like, oh, I get to be a counselor in training this year. And like, <laughs> had to make that like sort of transition into like adult goal orientation where it's like, oh yeah, I have to like free up time to like play with this band and like tour with them. He Like Matt Watts was like, do you like, do you know how weird it's going to be for me to like tell promoters we can't play shows this summer because our singers at summer camp? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I guess that's like, that was sort of a wake up call. I was like, I got to like act a little bit older to like, you know, to hang with these guys. Did the band start taking off while you were still in high school? Yes. And we were kind of met with the contract to sign with drive through when I was still in high school. So that was like a little bit of a navigation. Um, I was like trying to see what my options were. I just went to my guidance counselor and just like asked her if I could like 
what like homeschool or do like what I could do so I could like go on tour and not have to go to high school. And mm -hmm. she was like, well, you know, you can't homeschool at this point because like the school system like doesn't honor like, you know, they don't transfer the credits or whatever it is. So, but she was um, she was like, listen, like you're in your sophomore. I was in either in my sophomore or my junior year. And she was like, you have like this many credits. You need like just a few more basically to graduate. So like you don't have to go to your senior year if you start going to like night school community college classes right now and you'll earn enough credits by this summer, like in the middle of the summer to be done with it. Uh, wow. and, I, and I'm like, what do you mean? Like done with high school? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do that. I'm like, why don't, why doesn't everybody do this? And she was like, well, some people do, but like a lot of people just like, you know, going, you know, spreading out their senior year and going to prom and having the experience. I'm like, oh, crazy. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> give, give me that. Give me all of that. There was like one other girl that was at the community college doing the same thing. And we would like see each other in like the breaks and we'd be like, this is great, right? And they're like, I know. <laughs> it was, yeah. So then, uh, yeah, I, I like got my diploma in the mail. I think my uh, my mom even picked up my diploma when I was on tour, like already. Like that's how little of a shit I gave about like <laughs> graduating. I was just like, ah, oh, so happy to be done. That's incredible to hear because it, it makes me realize just how out of it I was when I was younger. I mean, you're making plans to graduate early and talking to guidance counselors and going to night school. I just, I don't know what the hell I was doing. I would show up late and sleep through most of the day. And I almost didn't even graduate because I missed so many days my senior year. I, I just didn't want to go. So I, I just wouldn't show up. I feel that, man. I fucking hated school. Like I really did not like it. Uh, I did not have like a ton of friends there. Like the friends I did have, like, you know, like, they were they were great to me, but like I you know I had trouble like finding you know like a place to fit in with it. So like yeah, the idea of like just getting to go out and just like jump right into like basically a career like my dream career it was it was great. Like I know other people were going to the guidance counselor to like you know um, send away applications to colleges and try to like come up with a career path and to not ha even have to worry about that guesswork and and all that. Like it was. It was great because I don't I don't think I would have done well with that kind of um, life, you know. Right. And how did your parents react to all this? Were they supportive? They were like that was their only thing. Like that was my dad's thing. Was like they both they both knew that like s there was kind of something special happening with this band, and there we seemed to be getting a lot of opportunity a lot of opportunities, you know, presenting themselves. So like, I think they had, they had you know like it was on their radar that like, you know, special things were happening. Um, and then when I, you know, like I, I was coming home from track practice one day and I got the phone call that we were, you know, getting a contract um, offer for drive through. And then, so I told my parents that night and my dad's reaction was like, well, you just have to finish high school. And like, <laughs> that was, and that was his only thing. He was like, just finish high school. And then like, you can do whatever you want. And then I was like, okay. And I think I went to the, guidance counselor the next day and i was like how can i how can i do this <laughs> yeah because at the time that was the path you get on drive through then you get then you put out your next record on mca and that's it you got a big career yeah that was i mean that was working for for a few bands yeah and uh so i you guys weren't starting line wasn't on my radar at all back then because i was in hardcore la la land but the first time i heard of you guys this is funny i was at great american pub the one in langhorn and i was there with some people and i don't know who the the server was but he knew you guys and he's like oh they're kenny's in the band uh kenny's in the studio recording with the band and the studio engineer said his voice is the most spot on he's ever heard like it's just dead uh, on i don't what, know who said that that's nice whoever what said what do you that. think of that that's very nice yeah i don't uh, oh was that will yip saying that I have no idea. Oh, that's pro. I mean, um, it was probably around like ninety nine, two thousand. Oh, okay. So this was not. This was like a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I think that's very nice. I don't know who the who the hell said that, but like uh, anyone Tommy, that Tommy Tremble. No, it was some guy I didn't know. I wish oh, I could okay. remember who it was. But also, he said that you guys got that record contract, and so you all bought new cars. Is that true? <laughs> I uh, I don't think I bought a car until like 2000, 
five ish. I think that's the first time that I bought a car. But the other guys, I'm sure, I'm sure got got some got themselves a, a new lease. <laughs> <laughs> I've still never purchased a car. Maybe one day. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. That like city people, it's not as much of a thing. Like we were all burb kids, so like I was thinking about that too. Like, like we. <laughs> Like they took me to see Fast and Furious like unironically when it came out, you know, <laughs> like that's like, like we're, you know, we were all into punk rock and shit, but like the guys that were, you know, like, and like myself too, like we were probably kind of bros a little bit like, <laughs> or like bro influenced. Um, so yeah, like, like that, that like vanity of like rims and I never fucking understood rims and I still don't like, I, I remember like specifically asking the guys like, so why are you like these are really expensive, right? I'm like yeah, I'm like, but like you can't really see it when the car's moving. Like it just looks like <laughs> it, like just blurred silver. Like what does this do for you? It's very bizarre, and it's funny that you mentioned that because I don't know. In like 2006, I thought I was like Mister Downtown Philadelphia, but I was kind of a bro, and we got mm-hmm. real mad that this dude called us a bro before. But we were drinking Guinness and listening to hardcore and. I, yeah. I was still eating at chain restaurants like that. That uh, suburb kid is still in me. Totally. I listened to corn and I, and I fucking shopped at PacSun and I like I was, you know, like, but like, I, I don't think I was like full on like asshole, you know, like get the fuck out of my wit. Like I was, you know, <laughs> also bullied by that, by that brand of bro. <laughs> but like, you know, it's the environment that I grew up in. So it's just like, you know, it was, yeah. um. There's that was le- the culture. <laughs> There's levels to that though, because like I remember, I I remember being I played lacrosse all the way through. Right. <laughs> and that's like one of the that's like the most bro sport in the entire world because it's like not only is it like a prep school type thing, but like it's like a real there's like a real tough guy mentality that goes along with it, and it's like you would meet these kids and like they would be like, so what kind of music you listen to? And I'd be like, ah, uh, what kind of music do you listen to? <laughs> <laughs> because I I don't want to start an argument about this because if you're like you know if you're like yo I'm into Incubus but like fuck man I'm into Incubus too <laughs> like yeah. I'm, I'm not starting shit with you like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and you know what I'm not ashamed to admit I like chain restaurants it's it's my heritage I'll fuck with Chili's Applebee's Outback Steakhouse I don't care that was that was life that was nightlife for like a you oh, know an that, adolescent yeah. was going to Denny's and going to yeah, IHOP that, like and okay. just getting a, a coffee and like just milking it all night so that was you know that was suburb life exactly it has a time and place and look I travel for work sometimes you're in the Midwest and that's all there is yeah what do yeah. you get when you go to Chili's Keith like do you just get like chicken fingers and stuff Last time I went, I got I I needed an actual meal because I'd eaten trash all week. So I just got a like a steak and mashed potatoes and a vegetable. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I always think about that. Like when you go to like when we were in uh, on vacation and we get, we were in in Disney and our flight got delayed because there was horrible thunderstorms here in Philly on and we couldn't land. So like literally, they were like, "You're staying here for another day." So they put us up in a hotel, but it was like away from Disney. And it was like way close to the airport. So it was like near SeaWorld. So we were like, all right, we can, we don't have a car. We literally have to walk to go get something to eat. So we went to TGI Fridays and I was like, I'm going to get, I don't know, like it's TGI for like a hamburger or a quesadilla or chicken fingers or something like that. My mom is like looking at, she goes, uh, I think I'll have the sea bass. I'm like, fucking mom. No, like <laughs> we're in the middle. Of, I was like, we there's like actual like seafood restaurants around. If you want sea bass, we can go get like sea bass. And she's like, no, I don't want to have to get an Uber and all this. And I was like, oh my word. I was like, please <laughs> don't order that. It's been frozen for fucking six months. Like you no- got to match the venue you're at. If you're at Chili's, you get a burger yes, or like, or like, a you know, you don't get, you don't get fish at a diner. You know, you don't, you gotta, you gotta match where you're at. It's true. You gotta read the room. Exactly. So starting line is is getting fired up. What was uh say it like you mean it the drive through debut? No, we put out an EP on drive through the um We the People? Is no, it, the, it was an EP the... called uh, it's got a tricycle on the cover. It's called um what is With it called? Hopes of Starting Over. That's the one. It's got a long name. Yes. And that was like yeah, that was uh our first release on drive through. And then I think even yeah, I guess we were still on drive through when we did say it like you mean it. That like it kind of transitioned to MCA, mm-hmm. I think by the time it came out. Um, so we were just kind of there very quickly. So we get you know 
put in that uh like lumped in with them you know because it was like such a like formative time for us but it was a really kind of only a year or two that we were even signed to them oh really yeah so you put out the ep are things firing up pretty quickly do you notice the tour is getting bigger and the show's getting better yes so our first tour ever was with the rx bandits and they took us like on our first full u.s and that was the shit man like and that's still like i'm just so glad that that was my first tour because even still that band is i think one of my favorite bands and i think just such a great role model to be on tour with like Mm -hmm. for as a you know 16 year old at that point like to like see this band that was so serious about what they were doing and like also just like so in control of their creative vision. Like it it was, it blew me away. And like, I did not see that coming. I kind of just thought that they were like the ska band on the label and yeah. they fucking like just shattered every like uh notion that I had about them. And like, you could see it from that point too. They like, you know, they made the resignation after that and like really just started this like super progressive musical co- career. And like, um, it it was it was awesome and like even just like the you know ins and outs of just how to act while you're on tour and how to treat people and how to like you know how to like stay at someone's house and like you know have fun but also be like gracious like it was um it was fucking awesome you know and they also just like let me ride in the van and like showed me black sabbath and just like <laughs> you know like it was uh, just could not have been cooler to to a kid like me so what was it like being 16 years old on a tour like that I mean, it had to be overwhelming. When I was yeah. 16, I was I was super, super ignorant to the world. I hadn't really started drinking yet. I hadn't done any drugs, really. I was just, you know, so I might have been okay at 16, actually. But how was it for you? Was there temptation? Was there difficulty? Or were you just kind of caught up in it all? Yeah, I mean, like, I was just kind of having fun with it. Like, I was, like, uh, a very excitable, you know, just, like, super happy like um just like smiling kid so like i was just like super stoked all the time um and like yeah just like uh kind of like wide-eyed with wonder about the whole thing um you know like i i was supposed to be like getting ready for my senior year of high school and i was like traveling the world like in a van you know (laughs) like smoking bowls with the RX bandits, like listening to like Hella and fucking mates of state and, <laughs> and, uh, and black Sabbath. And like, it, it was just awesome. And like the, also like my, my new, like best friends, like, um, like we were signed, like people liked our band. Like I was seeing, you know, like grand Rapids, Michigan. Like I was just like, what the, <laughs> I, like, what the fuck? Like I, I, I had never seen, anything before so like right um it was probably a lot of culture shock and you know like i hope you know like i tried to you know like navigate that and handle it like the best way that i could but you know i was a fucking kid and like i'm sure like at some points i was making fun of things that i shouldn't be making fun of and whatever but like that's something that you have to like go through and like you know learn your lessons and um the next time you come back just like act better and and fucking you know like you get the the experience of doing it. But I think that that, you know, that experience of being put in like real life scenarios so like quickly in life, I, I feel like it did a lot for my character. And, and I'd, I'd like to think that it's in a, in a positive way. You know, it gave me a lot of life experience that I couldn't have gained otherwise. I'm with you on that because, you know, when I lived in Levittown, I was Levittown. I only thought one way. I emulated the people that were around me. But getting out, being on a couple national tours with my friends band, living in a couple different cities, you get perspective. You meet a lot of different types of people. And man, I think I just think that's the way to go. Absolutely. So I went back and listened to Say It Like You Mean It. And this album is just what you described. There's an edge to it. There's beautiful melody. I get very warm feelings from listening to it. And I don't know if it's just because it's such a popular song or what, but the best of me is just, I just am so happy listening to it. I listen to it like 50 times. It's just, it's incredible when, I mean, it has over 25 million plays on Spotify, 
or for Tommy, over 8 million plays on YouTube. Bro, um, YouTube so- is so good. Wow, <laughs> it has so much stuff. <laughs> YouTube is such a good website, guys. Thank you, Kenny. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by YouTube. <laughs> yeah, look, it, I and it's the funny thing is, is like I use it all the time to go back and, and watch stuff of like, especially because like things on Spotify that you can't find, like live performances of bands. And I'm like, all right, I want to see this perform live. And it's like, Oh shit. Like there's like 30 performances on here. Like yeah. one of the ones that I got super into probably, uh, when I was in like eighth or ninth grade, um, I bought, uh, Afghan wigs, black love. And, oh, hell yeah. uh, one of the songs on there is my f- favorite song of theirs of all time. It's called faded. And somebody put like a seven minute version from them. Uh, I, I think it was, uh, in England and, <laughs> It's just Greg Dooley just being a dick on stage for like the first two minutes. He's like calling people out in the crowd. Like it's really a great. And I was like, see, this is why YouTube is amazing. Like, well, it is. And I'm on it a lot. But my beef is with brand new stuff. It's usually not on YouTube right away because (laughs) of licensing. So I, I want Tommy to be on Spotify. So if I discover a new band, I can send him the track and be like, yo, we got to get these guys on the show. So Kenny, he gets mad because I'm super cheap and I won't pay for Spotify premium. That too. I'm super but cheap. Isn't there, there's a Spotify free though, so you can- Yeah, we got to listen to ads and stuff. I don't do that's that. That's true. That's true. <laughs> do you have the free Spotify, Tommy? No, I got rid of it. Oh, <laughs> you see the, see the difficulty he causes me, Kenny? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, anyway, best of me. When you guys wrote that, did you know you had a hit on your hands right away? You had to have. No, I mean, like, I don't even know that that was, I mean, like, I know that we thought it was a solid song and we were like, okay, that like, I'm when we were writing those songs, it was like, we okay, we got to get songs together for a full length. Like, we knew we were doing a record with Trumbino and then we had that one and it was just kind of like, yeah, that one's done. Like, yeah. and now here's another one. Like, I'm sure that there was... um I don't know. I, I never remember specifically like writing it and be like Eureka or anything like that. I would just felt like, yeah, that's a good one. Let's, let's keep that one. In yeah. There. So let's talk about that time, you know, that we were touring on that album. The song is out. It's a hit. How, how big were things? Cause I was living in a, in a bubble in uh, Bucks County. Like how big were the shows? I mean, could you like walk out on the street and people knew who you were? No. I mean, like I would get like, recognize at the mall every once in a while but that was like <laughs> that's kind of it but like um it was getting good like it was it would be at the point where we could like get you know like a really good spot on a show or get you know like our second show ever was with uh saves the day and hershey pa oh, um, nice. at studio 22 with like the commercials and running from dharma and like other like really good local bands yeah and um that was all because matt watts was like just so good at networking and like just like getting on aol and like finding the right promoters and the right people to talk to and like he was the you know the one that got us connected with the people who got us connected with drive through and um yeah like i mean so when we were once we put out that ep on drive through i think that was kind of um like that really got things like solidified like around here when we first started playing before we were signed to drive through when we were still like kind of just getting like a little bit of hype going we were really having an easier time in new jersey playing shows and we would trade shows with like hidden in plain view who were like still a, you know like they were a band all the way back then and you know like um folly and face first and um like uh for whatever reason like even though it was like still like a hardcore scene in Jersey, there was like, for whatever, maybe it was like the saves the day thing. There was just like a little bit more of an opening for bands that sounded like us. Yeah. Yep. Like in Philadelphia, it was uh, a lot of just hardcore bands or like, you know, kind of kid dynamite sounding bands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like, we weren't quite welcomed with open arms to like the local scene. Right. Um, you know, but, we, but like we did get on like 20 minute fest and like, and some Palunka park shows and stuff like that. But I, I remember us oftentimes traveling to Northeast Jersey to play shows. Yeah. That a couple people have said that Pat Shannon from all field, he put it well. He said there was purity tests 
for bail. <laughs> like, like yeah, if, you did, I, if you if you didn't meet the criteria, you were out. No, for sure. I mean, like I, you know, and I was also like, you know, so naive to like the like hardcore scene and stuff like that. Like, I mean, I had gone to like local hardcore shows and stuff like that, but the actual like inner city, like Philadelphia, like hardcore scene was um like a little bit dark from like what I had heard. And like, yeah. you know, yeah, I would bad. just hear these like stories of like, Oh yeah. Like, uh, you know, like it would be like horror stories of like, Oh yeah. Like hardcore kids fucking stabbed the uh, get up kids sound guy at the church last weekend. Yeah. And like, I don't even know yeah. if that's true, but that was like an urban thing that was like going around. And I'm like, Oh God, like there was what? a riot at a get up kids show at the, uh, at the kill time, I don't know exactly what happened, yeah. but I, I know that it did happen. Yeah. So, yeah. like, uh, I always remember being, like, a little bit, like, intimidated to kind of, like, get, you know, be accepted by by the <laughs> Philadelphia scene because, like, from an early age, it was just, like, always evident that, like, it's it's a tough, it's a tough, like, music scene to break into. Yeah, it's like the mafia. Once you're in... They're like, uh oh, are they gonna ask me for a favor next? Like, what, <laughs> yeah. what's gonna go? Are they gonna bring a gun in a box to my door and I gotta hide it? <laughs> totally. And it's like, I and I loved hardcore music and I still do. Like, I, I mean, like it, yes. it just fell under the umbrella of everything. Like, I fucking loved local bands. Like, if local bands had a sick drummer, guitarist, uh, bass player, singer, like any of that, like I'm into it. And like I would get their shit and like not really like read too much into like you know what the message was a lot of the time. But like, I was just like, I just like good bands and I would go to see everything. And then, you know, it would, you know, for, for whatever reason, it just seemed like we were having an easier time, like fitting in our sound in Jersey. And then by the time, like the year 2000 and 2001 rolled around, there was like, you know, the taking back Sundays who, who we could like bring down from Long Island and like play with us in Philly and would like, you know, give us a little bit of cred because they, you know, <laughs> I don't know, you know, like used to be in fucking sons of Abraham or whatever. So it's like, we, we, by like a few degrees, like got a little bit of um, like clout to be able to play with those kinds of bands. But like, I was always just like, Oh my God, do I belong here? <laughs> was there ever a crazy mismatch show you played like taking back Sunday and Candiria or anything like that? <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to think like, you know, there, the weirdest thing, like, I feel like the, the show that stands out of being like the poorest, um, reception was like, I feel like it was somewhere in the Bay area and we were on tour with set your goals. And there was like some kind of like semi like hardcore ish kind of show going on. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot of those like set your goalish kind of bands that what it wasn't even like totally hardcore to me. It was like a little bit of like I don't know. It sounded like like pop punk with breakdowns. But yeah, right. for whatever reason, like kids were like throwing change at us and shit. Like when we were playing, and I was just like super bummed. I was like, what the fuck? Like I don't know. Like I get that like we sound kind of lame to certain people, but I was like, what the fuck? Like this is just like it's not even about like being cool. You guys are just like shitty fucking people. Yeah, it's. I don't know if it's just that I'm older and I'm in a different scene now, but it doesn't seem like stuff like that happens as much anymore. Like I wonder yeah. if there's. I wonder if there's a crazy mafia esque dark underground hardcore scene somewhere still, or if there's uh, crowds that would throw change at a band. It do, it doesn't seem to be a thing anymore. No, and I really have only experienced it that one time, and and it's no way indicative of like what you know, like the uh, Bay Area hardcore like scene. I imagine it's it's like completely stand up, like in every other show. It's just like for whatever reason that just show was an anomaly where I think there was just some bad apples there that were just fucking assholes. So yeah. it's like you know, um, everything else you know, like we've played with super hard bands, you know, like all the time, um, and. And we did fine. Yeah. Like, I think once we kind of, you know, like just wet our beak a little bit in, in the local scene, like people were, were pretty warm to us. Like once we actually could start getting booked in Philly, like everything was, was totally groovy with us. That's good. So you got the day, you got the debut LP out, things are going, you're getting on good tours, right? Playing good shows. Yeah. Yeah, everything was good. And like, yeah, uh, Best of Me eventually like started popping. Like when we started playing shows, it was kind of like eventually became the closer. 
and um like i i kind of get it now like i think that there's some sort of message that i didn't even really intend at the time but like it seems to just like mirror like the idea of like eternal youth which is something that's like very attractive to like you know people that still really love pop punk which i you know it's nice it's like i uh i like that it's got that tie into to like the whole scene yeah i feel that i didn't even I didn't even know the band back in the day, but I hear that now and I have instantly have that feeling. So there, there has to be some kind of tie in there. Yeah. It's nice. It was like, I mean, I really just wanted to like fill a page back then. So it's like, I don't, <laughs> I'm just glad that, that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's held up for people. So what do you write about when you're that young? What's going on in your life? When, when I was that age, I was always devastated over some girl and I really liked the saves the day, like the free form, you know, you're just writing down every thought you have. And those are the lyrics. That was, that was kind of my thing. What were, what were some of the themes you were dealing with? Yeah. A lot of that, a lot of, you know, like that's what's on your mind back then is like when you're that age, you want, you know, you have like love interests and like unrequited crushes and shit like that. So yeah, there was uh, like whoever like was a love interest. I would just kind of like focus, um, several chunks of records back then but it was like i didn't even have much experience like in that it was just uh yeah just trying to like yeah it, like honestly trying to sound you know um like my idols and just try to like be like be writing on the same level as like you know the saves the day records or like the promise ring records um and that was yeah like i i think as far as approach i've always kind of just tried to write about what's going on with me. I don't really write in character or anything like that. Right. Um, I just try to like have um, it back then. It was a little bit more of just like a train of thought and just like get it down and like, you know, rhyme it and shit like that. And like, I try to have a little bit more purpose this day, these days and like really flesh it out and be a little bit more like succinct about what I'm saying. But mm-hmm. back then it was just sort of like, I was just be like, oh, is that a word? Like, am I using that word right? Like, <laughs> um, I, you know, like I wasn't like a, a, uh, an English whiz or anything like that. So it was just trying to make it like make some sort of sense. Sometimes on this podcast, I'll use, I'll take a risk and use a word that I think sounds fancy. And then when I'm editing, I realized it's the complete wrong word. <laughs> yeah. So then oh, I yeah. have to dub in the right word. Yeah, I've had like producers be like, uh, I think you mean this word. And I'm like, okay, yeah, totally. Keith, what was the last one that you were like, you even texted me, you were like, yeah, I called Eddie Van Halen an auteur. And I was like, yeah, that's like a filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so sick if he was. I was yeah. like, I don't, I don't, I don't even remember you saying that. <laughs> I thought it meant like top artist, like an innovator. You know, if I didn't look that up, I totally would have just like, not even bat an eye. <laughs> Let me ask this about the starting line. A lot of bands and some bands I've talked to, they have major label experiences and they just walk away very dissatisfied with the whole thing. Did you have anything like that? Yeah, but only when MCA became Geffen, then we had a really hard time with them. And that that tends to happen, you know, like there's just these like takeovers that happen or what I don't even know like the other guys might be able to tell you better than than I could, but it was basically like they were um, they like transferred ownership and like MCA was just bought by Geffen and it's just like you're you're Geffen now there is no MCA mm-hmm. and I'm like okay well what about that guy that like you know we were working on the record with he's like fired <laughs> it's like oh. new new people and the, this new owner and uh, this guy Jordan Schur who's just like you know like famously just kind of like failed his way upward. I mean, I I, I don't want to talk too much shit on the guy, but like, I mean, he was not that like great to me or anything. So I don't really have a lot of like, you know, uh, whatever, you know, like I'm sure he's doing fine now. Like I tried to actually looking up his Wikipedia and like, he just kind of, you know, fell off the face of the earth. Like after doing like a few other deals I'm sure he's doing fine, and that's the problem with this country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Like, he's, I mean, he really is, like, a Trump kind of, like, 
character like he yeah. he even kind of looks like him he just, and it's just kind of like has that bullshit all the time where he's just like pumping himself up all the time is just telling you about all the important shit he's doing oh, God. and just like you know and this is like a half hour of that shit before you can even begin to talk about like the record you're working on <laughs> um so like yeah I, I did not get along with this guy uh and so it's just like we we're all of a sudden like signed to this label that has like a new name and this new guy and like is you know trying to just like play us like the the newfound glory record catalyst and like be like you got to write something like this like and i'm just like what are we doing here like that's a, that's another band that's like on your label like you have that like yeah how about just let us you know like be our be our band you know and i wanted to be like you know probably the most experimental that I had like attempted to be in the band at that point. So it just was like two opposing forces, like meeting each other. But we basically just had to have a conference call with him after the release of based on a true story and just like asked to be released because mm -hmm. we were just, you know, really unhappy there. And it was just not obviously not a good fit. And he let us go. And like, to his credit, I think that that was like the like kindest thing that he could have done for us and like, didn't make a big thing about it and didn't like torture us through it. Like, so, um, you know, like he's on my good side now. And like, I, you know, it, it was like, it gives me a story to talk about it, and it gave me like some angst to write about back then. So like, I definitely do not wish him ill will. It just like was not a match made in heaven. Did the band ever break up or did you guys just kind of take hiatuses when you were doing other projects? Yeah. Like, well, we put out, uh, one more record after that Geffen one. We, we signed to Virgin records, uh, for mm -hmm. that one and had a great time. Like love the people at Virgin. Like they just fucking let us do our thing, you know, like with a little bit of like, you know, kind of torturing us over singles, like, which is c to be expected on any major label. Right. But, um, I had such a great time making that third record direction. Um, and we made it out in LA with Howard Benson. And like, I, f I feel like that was also like the best one musically. Like, you know, I know it doesn't have like the hits on the level that some of the others do, but like that one actually like felt like, okay, like it sounds all put together and like, it actually like is like, you know, like a tempo that like feels like it, we're settling into something that sounds like truly us. Yeah, the band sound really matured. You can hear the maturity in the songwriting. You can just hear the growth. It's not like the raw, young, pop punk energy, which is also good, but it's just it's just another form of good. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so that one, you know, I had a really great time doing that. And we and then we finally tore it off it. And like we could kind of like see the writing on the wall that like it was maybe like the twilight of our, you know, popularity. So rather than like you know, we had no new songs after we toured on that record. And like, I was, you know, like immersed in new projects that were like fully experimental. And like the mm -hmm. other guys were like immersed in projects that were like fully, you know, just like pop, you know, like um, songwriting kind of kind of driven stuff. And so we were just like, seemed like we kind of like merged at a, f a fork in the road, like creatively. And but we all like still like, you know, got along for, for the most part. Like we still like uh, had a very good working relationship with one another, like despite just like the, you know, like annoyances that like are going to come with being in a band with anyone for, you know, whatever it was like 12 years at that point. And, uh, yeah. So we, you know, d a after that tour cycle, I think we just kind of took a look at everything and just said like, let's just back off it for a while. And, um, you know, take you know take some time with our other projects and then we would still just like play once a year like around um the holiday season in like philadelphia and new jersey or new york so we would still see each other once a year and it never felt like totally weird or like we totally broke up like or we were on you know the outs with one another it just mm -hmm. was like it was just a winding down because you know we had other things and mike had a family there was you know there was a uh, a lot of it just seemed like an appropriate time to take take a step down so that's good because so many times bands end up i don't know there's fighting and bad relationships and stuff but you guys were just like okay this is it for now and we'll get together when we can yeah totally um it was also like really hard like every night touring um i know that that's like a total cliche, cliche like thing that you're gonna hear from bands but like especially i mean 
being like whatever I was like 22, 23 years old and then trying to sing these songs that I wrote when I was 16 years old, like, and have that kind of energy. It was like, I was really transitioning in this way where like my voice was not handling it well. And, um, I was just like feeling like a little bit stifled creatively. And, uh, it was like, I think the best thing that we could have done to like give us perspective on how much like we appreciate being in the band. Cause I'm sure at that point it was like hard to see after like doing it for such a long time. For sure. And being on the road all the time is hard. It's hard. It was hard. I went on a couple tours with this day forward. I was selling merch for them. It was hard then. And it's even harder now. Cause f- for my job for a long time, I traveled pretty much constantly. I'd be in one state. I'd have to fly to another state. Uh, I'd fly out to California Monday. I'd fly home Friday. I'd fly back out Monday. It's it's hard. And if I if they ever put me back on a travel schedule like that, I would find a new job because I, I just wouldn't be able to do it anymore. Yeah. I mean, the the traveling part is actually my favorite. I really love it. It's it, the, the thing with me was just like the endurance of it. Um, like actually physically I could like barely talk after shows, you know, like mm-hmm. I had to, you know, and I, I met a lot of singers like this too. Like these headliners for bands that we would be like supporting would just be like whispering after the show because like they have to save their voice yeah. for the next night because they have to play a goddamn like 18 song set again. Um, and yeah, it was just like, I just felt like it's sometimes I sounded like shit just because I was like really like, like trying so hard to like push but then like you know um reserve my voice and it it became like really really frustrating and i was like worried i was gonna you know like hurt myself um but yeah so it's uh and it's still it's still like really hurts to sing like that but (laughs) like we just only really play two shows in a row like now like where, where before we would play like six do you have to do a whole warm up routine and everything to to get in the zone? Yeah, I should. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I it's really more about like kind of breathing. I mean, I have to like basically like if I've sung that day, I kind of consider myself warmed up. Because mm-hmm. um, then, like it, you know, it's almost like every breath counts at these starting line shows. Because like if I warm myself up too much, I find myself like kind of wearing myself out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just really with starting line. It's just like it becomes um, taxing for whatever reason to like try to do that stuff again. When you were touring with the starting line, would you have to be chill and like not party too much or otherwise you wouldn't have your voice for the show? Because now in bands, I was always playing bass or guitar for a long time. So I could get completely obliterated and yeah. I often did. And I, 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 you know, I'd be able to hold it all together. Yeah, that was always a fantasy of mine, just being able to just be the bass player of a band. And I got to do it for Say Anything Once, and it was, oh my God, a dream. It was really, it was really fun. But yeah, having to like, oh my God, it really is like, you you have to sacrifice a lot of fun to, to, like, just the simple shit, like talking to people after a show, like no one really thinks about that, but that's like, would be the most painful thing. And I would just want to be like talking to my friends or my tour mates, like, at the after party or whatever. And like to just talk above a DJ would be so like excruciatingly painful. Oh, I would just have to go to sleep. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I hate yeah. that. And drinking was like, I was never a big drinker to begin with, but like drinking was just pretty much out the window because it just like would trash my voice no matter what. Yeah. And you know, about bass playing, like you were saying before, that's good foresight to, to learn bass. Cause I have found that finding an effective bass player is the hardest part for the band because i put a band together a couple years ago and i figured we would never find a good drummer found one right away on craigslist which was shocking and i could not find a bass player i i i I had guys that were too good too pro and then and they would take off or i had guys coming in doing their best less claypool impression and i and and i i would tell them like hey can you just play the low strings yeah. and they they couldn't do it so it, yeah. and i i could just never find another bass player it's oh my god i feel like i could talk about like good bass players in the scene all day like there was uh i feel like do you guys remember eben from saves the day? saves the day he was like the through being cool bass player i think so 
So like, I don't even know what the hell happened to that guy, but like, he was like the talk of the town among bass players. Like he was just like, especially on through being cool, just fucking shreds all over that record with his fingers. And like, he just also had the vibe. Like he would always be in the front of the stage and like just owning it. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's like, obviously like Manny from glass jaw, um, yeah. Uh oh my god, Nate from Sunny Day Real Estate. Like oh, I would just Jesus, geek, yeah. I, yeah. I would geek out over these dudes that would really like make it like really own the base, you know, and make it like noticeable and not like a you know, a fucking Les Claypool, like, you know, um tacky kind of way. Not that yeah. Les Claypool's tacky, but it, like what it's just like Les Claypool only works in Primus. Yeah. Like you, That's you true. can't do, be doing that shit in my band or in fucking Sunny Day Real Estate. That's true. I actually yeah. sidebar. I kind of have become like obsessed with Primus like the last couple of years. Like <laughs> I never really gave a shit about them until like my like when I was like nine, and then now again. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because they creeped into my YouTube algorithm, and I I've never seen any of their videos, and I keep watching the video for winona and her big, yeah. big brown beaver what, oh god it's where they're all dressed up as cowboys it's fucking wild it's so good yeah so uh schmutz and i when we were playing shows last year schmutz is the is the keyboard player for a starting line we would we're often roommates with each other at these hotel rooms and we would like i'd be like yo where are you at with primus you know like we're always just checking in <laughs> with each other about bands because we're kind of you know on the same page with with a lot of stuff and he's like He's like, yeah, yeah, a couple of jams. I'm like, yo, check, check, check out why those big brown beaver. When's the last time you heard this one? And so we would just kept like, we would be like quiet in a room, and like a few minutes would go by, and then just one of us would just go, hey! <laughs> <laughs> and just start, singing, and it would always crack up the other one. Yeah, and it's such a good song. A lot of the songs are too out there for me, but that one is just perfect. The video oh, and the song. Yeah, and the riff. It's like basically a two-note riff, too. It's like, it's so sick. Oh, um, yeah. With our remaining time here, let's talk about Vacationer. Oh, cool. Now, that is an excellent band. It's it's very modern. There's a lot of different elements going on there. It's very chill. I got a big drive coming up uh, this Saturday, so I'm always searching for family-friendly stuff. Oh, yeah. So I'm I'm going to be rocking those albums. Thank you, man. I'm so glad that you're into it. Yeah. So let's talk about how that came together. Yeah. Okay. So after starting line, like the uh, experimental project that I got into was personnel. Yeah. And I put out a few records with them and it was like sort of everything from like drive, like Jay who in inspired like post-punk, like angular hollery shit to yeah, like, I was, I was catching up on it recently and I, I heard this riff. I was like, that sounds like This Day Forward. And then I heard <laughs> yeah. this other riff and I was like, that sounds like Circus Survive. I was like, this yeah. is cool. Totally. I was just like all about like like post-punk and like, you know, post-rock and, yeah. you know, um, just like just like as experimental as I could get with rock music. Uh, and like, you know, d had a blast playing in that band with my friends. Um, and then like kind of ran into the same problem of just like taxing my vocals like pretty hardcore with like trying to get you know myself to sound like you know like rick froberg from from jehu yeah. and um i was just uh like i i think i even i recorded a couple of songs and like showed them to our manager and like it just did not get a good response out of them and i was like just like kind of a little like beating myself up about like, you know, where things were at creatively, like, you know, the popularity of personnel was not really like hitting. Um, so I was just like trying to take stock of like what to do. And um, I was listening to like just more and more electronic music. This was like 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. I was just, like li listening to a lot of like Fortet and um, you know, like, Jaga Jazzist. Uh, yes. Yeah. Like some, some like, you know, I was really fascinated by like hybrid electronic, um, like full instrumentation bands. Right. Um, and like, you know, it's kind of certain things that were that like broken social scene were doing and like Yola Tango. And I was like way into like lo-fi stuff like Beach House and found, you know, like the radio department. So I was like really listening to a lot of like more mellow 
less rock and roll stuff and you know just riding riding my bike a bunch and um just sort of like getting into this zone of like just listening to only mellow stuff and it kind of was like almost a retirement plan to like come up with some sort of project where i could just only make relaxing music yeah and that was just sort of like the first idea like have something that's both like electronic and like you know full instrument like i can still play bass and still like have all the the fun instruments but like but really make it like a what what is doing what kind of band um like even radiohead were like kind of an inspiration for it because i fucking love that band and and then finally seeing lcd sound system i was like oh my god like it, it was like a light bulb went off and i was just like okay like this band has like completely um like complete control over the crowd like complete control over the energy of this place mm -hmm. and it's it was like kind of dawning on me that they weren't doing it with like volume right uh or like heaviness like at all like oftentimes like parts would get less heavy and like the the dance floor would go so much go, go so crazy like they would subtract things and then it would you know like make the crowd go nuts so it it made me like realize that like dynamic could affect a crowd as much as like velocity or volume could if, if that makes sense. No, like that's a was, really good way of putting that. That's awesome. Yeah. So it like was like, I, it was almost like I was just like open a new door where I was just like able to approach music completely differently. And um, so that was like kind of the spirit that I went into it with it and um, met, uh, met these guys uh, in Brooklyn that were in a band called body language. I got, I got set up with a session with them and kind of just like, told them my mission statement of what I was trying to do and how like naive I was, you know, with electronic music. Like I was really all thumbs with like what electronic music was. I had like a drum machine and a synthesizer and like no fucking like idea, like what software did what, like yeah. nothing. I didn't even really know that like what sampling was at that point. <laughs> like, and I was, you know, like in my, you know, like mid twenties probably. So like they would, you know, they played me like, or I was, I think we all kind of were into washed out. Like that, that album kind of just dropped and I was like, yeah, this is really good. And they're like, oh yeah, that's just like a, this like eighties sampled, like slowed down. And I'm like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah, it's just like an eighties record. And they just like slowed it down a bunch. I'm like, you can do that. And they're like, well, you know, you might get sued if you don't like, <laughs> you know, if you don't clear it, but yeah, you can do it. I'm like, oh my God, like there's so many records you could do that with. Yeah. And so it, then there's another thing where it's just like, my mind was just kind of opening up to all these different um, approaches to electronic music that I'd never even really considered. And then, so I kind of just brought my sensibility with songwriting to, uh, you know, those other guys like crafting these electronic tracks with me. And we were just like trying to keep it chill and they were sampling a lot of like Polynesian stuff. And um, it just started clicking like right away. Once they started like hitting like a few like Hawaiian music records, like and we were just like, wow, this is like, I don't know that we've ever really heard anything like this before. And it just felt, it kind of felt like, you know, it, it definitely felt like a sound. Like I remember like we used like the same like kind of sample uh like the same like uh i don't know like bongo or like um like timbali sample or something like that and i was like oh yeah it sounds so good on this one too and then grant was like yeah some people call that having a sound and i'm like oh my <laughs> god like i have a sound <laughs> like this is, <laughs> this is great and um so i it was just another thing where i just like took to it right away and it was just like really when i was re recording that first record i was just trying to sound like um the lady from beach house I was like really just trying to like, she just like, seems like she just like pushes air like out of her windpipe and just does not like, you know, I don't know. It just does not belt anything. Like, it's, it's very just, breathy. Like, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. always breath and always like, um, like kind of, you know, chill and, and like seductive or something. And that's like, it's not how it like came out, but at least like put me in the frame of mind to be able to like, try to do something a little bit different with my voice and try to just like relax. That's great. And, you know, 
a lot of the music we listen to, meaning myself and Tommy, there there's a there's a ceiling on a lot of those projects. If you're in a hard rock band, if you're in a hardcore band, if you're in a weird or edgy band, like it can only go so far. But I feel like with something like Vacationer, there's so many different options. Like there's instrumental stuff. You could do a, a DJ type thing. Like maybe you can jump on a soundtrack. There's just there's it seems like there's a lot of options. Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, that's the nice thing about it too, is I can kind of like produce under the name Vacationer and it still like can can fall under the blanket. Um yeah, it feels like it's a little bit more of a universal um like moniker to like apply to to like my creative life. And I feel like really at home, you know, like making vacationer music. And it's also like an escapist attitude too, because I that's something that like I'm sure a lot of people crave especially these days is just like trying to get out of your own head and just like put yourself in like the most euphoric like uh kind of mind paradise that you can think of and that's like that's always been kind of my goal with the with the music we you know like lately with everything happening i'm trying to maybe like um blend in some like messages to like uh take down you know like capitalist fucking oh, <laughs> corruption you're, and like you're uh, talking my language s- systemic now. racism and shit like that <laughs> so i'm trying to put some easter eggs in there now that like i feel like there's there should be more purpose to making music and trying to be more punk rock about the lyrics but it still like sonically it's always going to have to be just like a bath for your ears I love that. And it, I love the contrast, too. I, li- I love when you have really heavy music, but softer vocals, and you can have really chill vibes, but also smash capitalism. That's, totally, that's yes. going to be my mission statement. <laughs> totally, man. Chill It'll vibes. be like a Trojan yeah. horse that's like, you know, the outside of it is like chill beats, and then inside is like, you know, destroying, you know. Yeah, uh, s- systemic fucking corruption. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's, it's inspirational, too, because you know, you didn't really know how to do any of that stuff. And you just went and learned it because I want to do that too. I don't, you know, I don't know how many more uh, late nineties post hardcore sounding songs I can write. I want to, I've been listening to the lo-fi chill hop station a lot. I want to do something. I want to learn that. I want to do some ambient stuff. I like that. I want to learn home recording and sampling. I want to learn all that stuff. That's going to be my next project down the road. Hey, well, um, I would recommend checking out Ableton Live. That's the the software that I've been using for like the last, um, I mean, I've been using it for about 10 years, but about the last like five years, uh, like professionally and in, in the records and stuff and did like my whole last instrumental record all on Ableton, like mastered it and everything. And it's just a lot of fun to, you know, if you want to do that kind of stuff, it's like really easy to get going quick. Nice. I'm going to, yeah, my friend uses that a lot. Do you know, uh, Steve Clifford from Circus Survive? Yes. And he was like, yeah, early on, um, yeah. early on in the 2010s, like when I was started messing around with Ableton, like he brought me over to his Philadelphia apartment and like, I think we were both at like the same show and he was like, and he was like, somehow Ableton came up and he was like, he was like, do you want to come over my place? You want to, you want to like check out some sessions? I'm like, yeah, sure. And then he like was the first, uh, one to like show me like follow actions and stuff like that, like cool little, you know, tricks that I would use all the time. So yeah, yeah, he was, he was always on that. And around that time I would go to his house and we would record these crazy songs. Like after being up all night, it was, it was a good time. Yeah. Steve's a good guy. He's a, yeah, he's a whiz on that. He's um, oh yeah, very smart. Just know that I'm up here and I'm working every day. I'm uh, writing and recording lots of stuff. I mean, a lot of, it kind of, at this point, recording a lot of um, like demos that are like I'm trying to record as well as possible. So if need be, like I can just um, turn this into like a new vacation or record and um, just like fix whatever doesn't sound good later or just like have it mixed professionally or just have it mastered professionally. Basically, like wherever it falls short, I'll like figure it out from there. But I'm just trying to f- finish as much of a vacation or record as I can which is going well. I'm I'm happy with how it's sounding. That's great. I'm looking forward to that. And that reminds me of another question. How are you faring in COVID times? How are you making ends meet? Um, well, you know, it's like there's not a lot on the books as far as like, you know, gigs, but there is uh a lot of time to be creative up here, which is like 
you know, kind of great because I always need a long period of time to be creative and like write a record anyway, because I'm not terribly fast at writing records. So to have a, a period of time where there's no real obligation, um, I'm trying to just keep focusing on it that way. You know, like obviously there's a lot of things that are super fucking annoying about it, mm -hmm. but um, I'm kind of a homebody anyway. So uh, yeah, it's nice to always have like the back pocket thing of, well, you know, like I don't want to catch this thing. So I'm just going to stay home and write my little songs. Um, so it's like, you know, it's as good as it can be. I'm very, I'm very lucky to be in the situation that I am and like, uh, you know, like have this space to like be creative and not really have to worry about um, like much overhead. So like everything, everything is okay in that sense. And like, I just, you know, I, I uh, feel for like the heartbreak of the world that it, you know, is like in all sorts of various forms, but um you know, like it's a, it's a crazy fucking time, which is completely goes without saying, but like, uh, music really helps. I'll just say that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And yeah, music, I, I'm, I'm a homebody too. I don't like to go out too much. So I enjoy the time indoors. I can work from home. Uh, Tommy and I figured out how to do this podcast remotely. So that's good. And I have plenty of hobbies to keep me busy. So my best to you guys, like stay safe out there and like to everyone listening to this, hope everyone is, you know, like doing their best and staying safe and staying sane. And, um, I love you and fucking vote for Biden, please. I know that we're not happy about it, but please do that. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I, you know. I don't know where you guys stand on politics. So I, I guess I'm being presumptuous by just sho shoehorning that in. And neither of us are Trump supporters. That's for sure. Right, Tommy? No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, my biggest thing is that I, I'm a, I'm a teacher in an inner city school. So it's like, I've seen what, you know, I've seen how my kids have reacted to this over the past, you know, like the last 18 months or so. And it's just, you know, there's, it's time to, uh, it's time to change things around a little bit for sure. Totally. And you know, like I'll say with the, the asterisks of like, I don't know what the fuck like Biden is going to change. Like, like honestly, like he's not my guy. And, no. uh, and at this point, like, I think it's obvious that like the energy that I have is just getting Trump the fuck out of office because like this guy, um, I don't know. Like if you honestly think that like the last four years are better off because of what this man has done, like then like, we are on completely different like solar systems. Yeah. Um, so like, please just like get this motherfucker the fuck out of there. Uh, and then like, I can at least begin to like, feel like back in my own skin, <laughs> like and maybe a few other people too. I don't know. I'm yeah. sorry. I don't know. Yeah. Like that just came out. I've never publicly endorsed the guy before, <laughs> but like, I just cannot fucking take any more of this shit. Well, thank you for that, Kenny. <laughs> and you know what? Yeah, I mean, I don't think Biden will. Che I don't think Biden will make anything worse. I right. don't. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think he's going to make anything worse. So we have that at least. It yeah. would be tough. It would be. <laughs> it would be really. T I mean, that would be. Uh, it'd be tough. I actually have a question for Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get hooked up with Cherry Cola Farms? Oh man. Um. So there's this guy Zach Falco, uh, who's out of uh, New York. And like, I don't know, he was just like basically hitting up farms just kind of like out of the blue um, with this like idea of like endorsing bands. He was just going to be like sort of the conduit between like musicians and like weed farms. Like he was, I, I, yeah. yeah, it was just like sort of this like abstract idea. It's like, I know a few bands, like what if, you know, or I, like I know some managers and uh, Randy, our manager, was one of the guys that he knew. And so I just got this random call one day. It was like, hey, would you be interested in like endorsing a weed or yeah, endorsing like uh, your own custom like strain of weed with this farm? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, can I <laughs> can I check out the weed? And they're like, yeah, you know, you have this college gig in Detroit. Why don't you just fly to California after the, like right after? I'm like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and so I just went out there and like went out to, and got like some sushi with them and smoked a bunch of their weed. And it was like so beautiful. Like their, their stuff is like no joke. Um, like the best weed I've ever smoked anyway. And they were like, so like meticulous about growing it like clean and organically. And it's just like 
delicious and like just like flavorful. Um, and so I, I don't even know if they're making the mindset strain anymore. Um, I know it was like kind of in limited run the last few times and I haven't heard much from it in a while, but like the opportunity to do that was so rad. And they were like very generous about like, you know, like hooking it up when we went out there and like, um, yeah, that, that farm, all those people super rad. That was a cool experience that I would do. And again, in a heartbeat, (laughs) would you get like a pound of your own strain? They would be very generous. Yeah. it It would be like the most like, more than I would ever like buy. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> what do you do if like it's your strain and you smoke it and you don't like it? Yeah, I guess that could have been a thing. I mean, like I I knew right away that like they were they were not fucking around when it came to like developing strains because they like even when they were first like um I don't know even know what it is like they're getting it to like there there's like a first uh little process before you even plant it. And so they were doing that with it and they have to like try it with all sorts of like different other strains. Like also like, you know, there, there, there's this really like, um, and there's like genomes and all this shit. There's just all sorts of science to it. So Mm -hmm. like I knew right away, like as soon as I tried all their stuff and like five out of five of them were all delicious and like Mm -hmm. completely like clear headed highs, like no headache kind of shit. Like I'm like, Oh, this is like, this is really, you know, yeah. I don't want, I don't want to like brag, but I, but I know my weed and, and <laughs> like, I knew like right away that this was like top quality stuff. Um, so I wasn't worried that they were going to like let something get across that was like not up to, up to par. Like they, they went through a pretty heavy vetting process before they even came up with like the first batch. Oh, that's so awesome. That is great. Yeah. I, I was never a weed guy. I, I got t- too into uh, other things, let's say, and I, I had to give it all up to save my own life. But if Purdue Pharma came to me today and was like, <laughs> we want to make the new Oxycontin and call it the Northeast Scene Pill, I, w- I would be all about that. Oh, no. No, I, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. They're, they're a horrible company, and they destroyed many lives. They have to, they have to close the company. Did you see that? That happened, Good. To, that happened today. Eight billion, yeah. $8 billion settlement. Uh, and they have to, they're shutting down, uh, Purdue Pharma. Good. Yeah. They're they're a fucking cartel. Did you guys watch the pharmacist? No. No. What is Uh, that? It's pretty good. It's on Netflix. It's about, it's a documentary about basically like this small time pharmacist that like kind of single handedly started taking down Purdue Pharma. Oh, I'm so going to watch that. That sounds awesome. Yeah, Yeah. it's good. I'm definitely going to, Oh, did you see, uh, my octopus teacher? No, I've heard about that though. Good, dude. You got to watch it. I'll check that out. Lord knows I've got the time, so I'll put that one on the list. <laughs> yeah, highly recommended. All right. Well, Kenny, this was great. The best part about doing this podcast is getting to talk to the artists we love, you know, from the past and new artists that we discover. But it's always extra special when we get to talk to someone from our hometown. So, yeah. you know, we just want to say thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. It was uh, a really good time. Thanks for letting me ramble. I hope it was a, a little bit coherent. No, you were oh. coherent. I was going to say this was all cohesive, and the nice part is, is that this one flowed like a conversation. Yeah, I agree. That this this flew by. This is a really good time, guys. Thank you for it. Absolutely. Thanks, and uh, talk to you soon. Absolutely. Take care. There you have it, folks. Kenny Basoli. That was an excellent, fun discussion. He's such a nice dude. <laughs> yeah. He really comes off as like, he's so relaxed and so fun and so like, you know what I really appreciate about him is like, he kept talking about things like things people would be like, oh no, I wasn't into that. He was like, dude, I'm into corn. I was totally into corn. I was in the Limp Bizkit. Like he's 100% authentic fucking rad dude. I, I, like, I that. like that. He's not, he's just into what he's into. He's not feeding into like the high of mindset or whatever else was going on at the time. That's it. He just does what he does. And, and at such a young age, I'm like that now. I'm just like, yo, I like what I like. If you don't like it, you know, that's too bad. But yeah, to be doing that at 15, 16. That's the other thing that kind of blew my mind is like 
at, at, being that young and being on national tours, I would have been a mess. Like God, th- thank goodness he has like the the wherewithal to be like, you know, be mindful of like, hey, I need to save my voice. Like I need to not drink. I need to make sure I'm talking softly after shows. I need to make sure like the preservation of that type of thing is like very very mature way to think through stuff uh definitely not something i would have done at that age if somebody was like here's free drinks i would have been like let's get fucking hammered i would have been in big trouble for oh sure god i would we would have made it two dates on the tour and they would have been like <laughs> keith and tommy have they have to go home somebody's gonna come <laughs> and get them he just sounds so well rounded too i mentioned it during the discussion but i was thinking about it again like he he knew to go to the guidance counselor and figure out how to graduate high school and make choices and have conversations. I was I was just so fucking out of it. Oh my like god! I was like I was like a a zombie. I just I don't know. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't think ahead. I didn't. Uh, I don't, I don't know what the hell I was doing. I definitely at that age let the world happen around me. I didn't take yeah. any, I didn't take any kind of like ownership or control over anything or try to do anything. I was just like, okay, this is happening now, so I'll just let it happen. <laughs> like, yeah. It's definitely not he was really 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 mature for his age. And the other thing is he, like, keep in mind like the, writing those types of songs and performing them, it's like that type of vocal range is not easy to maintain. Like he really is it. Like he's a phenomenal performer and I, I love his soul. Like his vacation and stuff is so good. And the fact that he took it upon himself to be like, I want to learn how to do this. Yeah. You know, I checked out their whole discography on that long drive this past weekend. I was in, I went to visit my family in New Hampshire and I checked out all their stuff and they're really good. They're really, it's really good stuff. And it's very relaxing. That, yeah. See, cause you know, I'm in the car with Romy and she wants relaxing. My idea of relaxing is like hum, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it's not everyone else's idea of relaxing. So vacationer was a hit. Yeah, dude, they're really, really good. And it's on top of that. It's just like, he's just a very smart person in terms of production. Like everything is well put together. Everything's well laid out everything's thought through it's really smart and i also like the fact that he has his own line of weed <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> that was one of the funniest things is i was like you know before the show i was like going through his instagram i was like hilarious this is one of the funniest things i've ever seen i was like i've never seen a band endorse weed <laughs> like, this is great <laughs> this guy's fucking hilarious dude what about weed eater or uh sleep yeah, but they don't, they endorse marijuana use. They don't necessarily endorse like an actual person. Like you can't go out and be like, I bought sleep brand weed today. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's like a, there's like literally a, like a, a, you can buy vacationer fucking <laughs> like weed. It like, it has their, has the logo on it and everything. It's fucking awesome. So we got a new email. You want to hear this? Yes, let's go. Okay, we got an email from Curtis, and he says, Hey guys, I'm a new listener, and I'm hooked. I dig hearing about the scenes all around the country. I am also going crazy trying to find the songs you use in the beginning and the end. Keep up the good work. Curtis, thank you so much for listening. I love when new people discover the pod and enjoy it. It's our favorite thing. And uh, I did respond to him, but for anyone else curious, the opening song is my band, The Basement Year. The song is called Uncomplicated. It's on every streaming service and YouTube, Tommy. There you go. And uh, the closing song is Tommy's band, Audience of One. Does that song have a title? No, all of those were just called, uh, we never named anything. Everything was just called Movement One, Movement Two, Movement Three, Movement Four. Okay, but on YouTube, Tommy's favorite, search Audience of One four-track demo. And I think that song is the first one that comes up. And it's so good. It's just, whenever I listen to the podcast, I listen to that whole clip of that song at the end. It just reminds me of like really happy old times. I I get a really happy, nostalgic feeling from it. I remember the recording for that when the, you know, the big part in the beginning of the, woo! (laughs) Yeah. It was like 10 of us in the studio for that. I think Gary Shaw was there. Uh, I think Vadim was there. Like there was a bunch of us there. And it was just like, we want to put this in. And we're like, where? Right here. Let's go. <laughs> like It was so like spare of the moment. We want to do this right now. It was like hilarious. It's so well put together. 
it's not i like that song like everything i i like that four song ep more than i like anything else on the full length it's so good it's really it's it's just well done i liked it i really liked it and i liked playing it i liked being a part of that i liked writing that i liked right like everything about that was like it was just fun and it was really really fun when it became like you know what the crazy part about that stuff is is like we recorded that we never played it live that's a shame so but, you got to do the audience of one reunion let's get anthony on the phone and get it going I don't know if I can. I don't even own a bass anymore. I'd have to borrow Gary's <laughs> to, to call Gary and see if I can borrow his. I don't. Even, I don't even. And the funny part is, is oh, who's you're going to get mad at this? <laughs> that was recorded on a six string bass. Ugh. Uh, yeah, I know. Was it right? that one that was always at JD's house? Yes, I remember that bass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that was uh, my. I'm playing bass, but I still want to do heavy metal. And I'm hoping somebody sees this while I'm playing and asks me to be in their metal band. (laughs) Yeah. I have to admit, I always get jealous of those stories when people get poached for other bands or asked to be a part of things. I'm like, man, why didn't that happen to me? (laughs) I was never any good. That was my biggest, (laughs) my, my, my my biggest hindrance was I was a terrible bass player. (laughs) I don't know, man. I thought you were good. I was, I, I was mediocre. By the end of that, you know, what was really good. It was uh, the final song on that uh, four song EP. Uh, JD wrote the whole thing, um, and and I say wrote the whole thing. I mean, he wrote the guitar part, he wrote the drum line, he wrote the bass part. And when I say wrote the bass part, I mean he literally sat with me in his studio and he was like, "No, I want it to sound like this." Boo do 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 do. Like he sat there and like hummed it out. Mm-hmm. Like it, that's how involved, like, and so when I hear that song, I always think about like, wow, JD could have started his own band and been by himself. Like that's how good he was. He was just very, and the other thing was that kid's just a fucking genius. So like, yeah, he really is like the unbelievably smart. Oh, for sure. Well, here's a new music alert for you, Tommy, and for our dedicated audience. Did you listen to that new Jezu song? Yes, I did. I love it. It's called Alone. Check it out. I haven't heard them in a long time, but yo, they're back. That was good stuff. That was really good. Very I actually, uplifting, very dreamy. You know what? I've been listening to it a lot, and it's not new, but it's um, something that kind of like passed me by, and mm-hmm. it, I've been going back to it. Um, the Minor Times. I've just yeah. been listening. <laughs> they were so good, and I just, for some reason, never really paid attention to them, but they are an unbelievably good band. Like if you're into things like botch, um, like that's that style of like kind of chaotic kind of hardcore, they're right up your alley. Check out the minor times. They're very, very good all over YouTube, Keith. <laughs> oh yes. And Spotify. Cause we did a couple posts with their stuff. So I was checking them out. They're really good. I, I want to listen to the whole album though. And, uh, I got a song for you. Ready? Go. I did check. It's on YouTube. Okay uh nomads i think i've showed them to you before but listen to the song unwritten stories of the towpath trail a long song six minutes and 36 seconds yeah it's like a it's like an emotional post-rock journey you'll you'll like it oh i love stuff like that oh yes i've actually been like uh that's my new thing at night is uh after the girls go to bed i i I, uh, that's when I do any kind of like, I I try to exercise like three or four times a week. Mm -hmm. And that's what I listen to now is post rock stuff. So I've been putting on that, uh, there's a YouTube channel called where post rock, post rock dwells Mm -hmm. and just putting on random stuff on there. And dude, I've hit some really, really good ones. Um, but mainly I end up going back to like, Oh, I like this song. Let me go listen to Caspian. (laughs) I just end up, yeah or this will destroy you that's like both the, t- the between the two of those i i don't i just go i don't see the need for other music this is done <laughs> yeah if it, if it sounds exactly like one of those other bands i'll like it but it'll make me want to just go listen to that band like this nomad <laughs> song is extremely good i i was sitting on the couch trying to remember what it was for like 15 minutes it was driving me nuts and a lot of post rock sounds the same and i was like i'm never going to be able to figure it out i'm gonna have to go through every one of my playlists for the last three years (laughs) and i finally figured it out and it, it sounds exactly like 
early this will destroy you or explosions in the sky like exactly but it's it's great the whole album is fantastic that's awesome, dude. I, I literally, I, I, I can't wait to listen to that because that's one of those things that, like I said, I've been putting it on at night after the kids go to sleep and it's like, it's so nice. <laughs> it's I, I treated myself, I guess, about, you know, f- a few months ago and I, I bought AirPods. So oh, nice. I, and uh, I, I've been putting on AirPods and like doing exercises at night and stuff like that. But yeah, I really bought them for the skate park so I didn't have to have wires. <laughs> But yeah, there, there's nothing more annoying. Sometimes I'm leaving my house and the the wires from the headphones will get caught on the gate and everything gets ripped out of my head and my phone falls on the ground. It it pisses me off. So is, there, bad. is there nothing more frustrating than like something like that happening? And my immediate reaction, I don't know why, but my immediate reaction is I want to punch or break something like yeah. as soon as something like that happens, like, and it only seems to happen when I'm in a rush or pissed off about something else. That's exactly. when like I, I was, I, I, I was walking into school one morning and it's like there, I, I work on the third floor. So I walked in, parked my car, was walking up the stairwell and I was pissed about something. I can't even remember what it was, but I remember <laughs> At first, it got me. I, I it was so maddening. At first, it got me so mad. I actually started to laugh at it. But I was turning the last corner to go up the last set of steps on the third floor, and my belt loop got caught on the um, handrail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I literally like tried tried to take a step forward, and all I heard was <laughs> and my pants ripped. <laughs> and I was like, I was so mad because like oh. I, I was like. First of all, it's like it's seven o'clock in the morning and I have a full day of school. Now my pants are ripped on the side and I literally just had to stop for a second and just go, I'm just going to I'm just going to laugh at this. I'm just going to laugh because what else am I going to do? I mean, am I going to get pissed at this? Because I could. But at the same time, no one's ever like if I go to somebody and they're like, what happened to your pants? Be like, I got caught on the handrail when I was walking in. They're going to be like, what? And I'm, yeah, I look, I was just in a bad mood. I wasn't paying attention and I fucking ripped my pants. <laughs> like, it, it's such a dumb move, but it was like, it made me laugh the rest of the day. And the funny part was, is that I came home and my wife is really good at sewing. I actually showed her like and that her first reaction was not, how did you do this? Why did you do this? She, was, <laughs> she literally said, she looks at me and she goes, I can fix that. And I was like, good. And guess what? I still have those pair of pants and they're still holding up and they're from Costco. So, <laughs> oh shit. Look at that. That was an amazing callback. So I'm going to end it right there. Indest- indestructible Costco pants. What's up? Buy your pants from Costco. Continue to write us northeast scene at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, the NE scene. Thanks to all of our fans, old and new. We're looking for more. So let's get on board, man. Become a member. All you got to do is say that you are. You're in. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And until next time. Yeah!